Well, last week was supposed to be story time, but Jeff made the sermon, so we're doing story time this week. And I have two little books. They're called Following Jesus. You know, we talk about how we should be following Jesus and doing what he says to do. So let's see what these actually say. This one says, Jesus loves me. Jesus loves me. Jesus is God's son. What the Bible says, and before the world was made, God decided to make us his own. Children through Jesus Christ. And that's from Ephesians 1, 5. Jesus loves me. Jesus watches over me. What the Bible says, the Lord says, I will make you wise. I will show you where to go. I will guide you and watch over you. That's from Psalms 32, 8. Jesus hears my prayers. What the Bible says, the Lord listens when I pray to him. That's from Psalms 4, 3. Jesus shows me how to act. What the Bible says, do for other people the same things you want them to do for you. That's from Matthew 7, 12. Jesus keeps his promises. What the Bible says, the Lord will keep his promises. With love, he takes care of all of us he has made. Psalms 145, 13. Jesus loves me. Jesus wants me to go to heaven. What the Bible says, Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will have life even if he dies. That's from John eleven twenty five. 25. And then, Jesus listens to me. I love to pray to Jesus because Jesus helps me with my troubles. What the Bible says, if one of you is having troubles, he should pray. James 5, 13. I love to pray to Jesus because Jesus listens to me. What the Bible says, the Lord sees the good people. He listens to their prayers. Psalms 34, 15. I want to be like Jesus. What the Bible says, Christ is righteous. To be like Christ, a person must do what is right. 1 John 3, 7. Jesus teaches me to be kind. What the Bible says, but I tell you, love your enemies, pray for those who hurt you. If you do this, then you will be true sons of your Father in heaven. Matthew 5, 44 through 45. Jesus comforts me when I am afraid. What the Bible says, I will not be afraid because the Lord is with me. Psalms 118, 6. And I love to pray to Jesus because Jesus answers my prayers. What the Bible says, and if you ask for anything in my name, I will do it for you. Then the Father's glory will be shown through the Son. If you ask me for anything in my name, I will do it. John 14, verses 13 through 14. So there's scriptures all through the Bible that support Jesus loves us and Jesus helps us and listens to us. Y'all want Pastor Jeff to say a prayer? Heavenly Father, please continue to help us to learn, to learn the ways you want us to be and to work in the ways you like. Continue to help us to walk in the footsteps of Jesus Christ, your one and only begotten Son, and in whose name we pray. Amen. How many of you recognize this game board? How many of you have ever played it? Amazon.com says the game of sorry is the fifth best selling board game on their sites. But sorry is not really an original game. It is one of many variations on a game that originated in India called Parcheesi. There are other games based on the same concept, and they have names like Aggravation, Trouble, Frustration, and there's even a game called Wahoo. As I was researching this sermon, I came across a picture of one of the boxes Sorry was sold in. 
and found the tagline on the box, called it the Game of Sweet Revenge. And I thought at the time, that's an odd phrase to describe a game that is called sorry. We don't usually connect the word sorry with revenge. But apparently the company that owned it thought it was a great idea. Uh, in fact, in a 1994 TV advertisement for the game, that was precisely the idea. Always remember to forgive and forget. Sorry. You hit me, I'll get you back. The game of sorry. Slide, switch, and bump your way home before someone makes you. Sorry. And sends you back. Do we understand? Sorry. You hit me, I'll get you back. Sorry. Ben Stein was portrayed as a stodgy teacher trying to teach his students about forgiveness. Always remember to forgive and forget. He says, but the kids are having nothing to do with it. They are playing sorry. The game of sweet revenge. And the voiceover of the commercial says, I'll get you for that. At the heart of the game is the acknowledgement that saying, I'm sorry, it's not quite the same as being sorry. And actually, that is true. Did you realize that the Bible never uses the words, I'm sorry, or you should be sorry? I've looked it up. But by contrast, the word forgive, forgives, Forgiven and forgiveness shows up at least 119 times. At least that's by my count. Might be off. But why would that be? Why would God prefer us saying, forgive me, to saying I'm sorry? Well, because sorry doesn't call for a response. Let's say I drove into the parking lot this morning and I ran into John's car. And so I go over to John and say, I'm sorry. Does John have a response to that? No. No, he doesn't, does he, at all. I have simply expressed that I'm sorry. And I'm not looking for him to say anything in return. But now, let's say I drove into the parking lot and I ran into Carol's truck. And I say to her, Carol, will you forgive me? You see, when I ask for forgiveness, I'm asking for a response. Saying I'm sorry is actually the easy way out of it. Because if I were asking for forgiveness, I'll risk getting an answer I might not want to hear. If I ask Carol for forgiveness, what is one of the worst answers I can expect? No. Asking for forgiveness exposes me to a potential of being rejected and humiliated. I don't want that. So, I may be more inclined to say something to you that doesn't ask you to say anything in response. To just slip by saying, I'm sorry. Saying I'm sorry it's just so much easier than saying, forgive me. And God doesn't want us coming to him and just saying, sorry. Now, that doesn't mean that being sorry is a bad thing. In 2 Corinthians 7, 9, Paul says, 
Now, I am happy, not because you were made sorry, but because your sorrow led you to repentance. Their being sorry led them to repent. Their sorrow led them to want to change their lives. And that was a good thing. But too many times people will be sorry but never repent and never change. That's why God never tells us, just be sorry. That's not enough for Him. He wants our sorrow to lead us to repent and to ask for forgiveness. He wants our sorrow to lead us to want to change our lives. And if we are willing to ask for forgiveness, if we are willing to confess our sins to Him, admit we've been wrong, and humble ourselves before Him, then God promises He will forgive us. In 1 John 1, 9, we're told, if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us for all unrighteousness. Now, I don't want to get too technical on the original Greek of that verse. But basically, it's saying that as often as we confess, confess our sins and ask for forgiveness, God forgives every time. One man explained it like this. Back in college, a bunch of the guys from his dorm floor went to a nice restaurant before Christmas break to celebrate the end of their first semester as freshmen. His roommate, who loved the new policy at the time that restaurants were adapting, unlimited refills on sodas. So that night, he drank Pepsi after Pepsi after Pepsi. Now what he didn't know was this particular restaurant did not honor the free refills. And so he was charged for every single one that he had drank. And he nearly fell out of his chair when the waiter brought his check. You see, his friend was expecting to get free refills. What he got was a bill where he had to pay for every soft drink that he had that whole night. And that illustrates the difference between how the world does things and how God does things. The world expects that we should pay for every sin we commit. There's no, no forgiveness of sins in their minds. Just a bill at the end for every sin. But with God, when we ask for forgiveness, it's like we've gotten in on free refill night. <laughs> over and over and over again. With every time we confess that we are wrong, God takes it off our bill. And we don't have to pay for it. Isn't that great? No other religion in the world offers something that comforting. Because this is God's offer not religions. But now, there is a caution here. There is a condition that Jesus sets, sets on our being forgiven. Jesus said when we pray, we should say, forgive us our debts. But how are we supposed to have our debts, our sins forgiven? Well, 
as we also forgive our debtors. In other words, we should expect God to forgive us in the same way that we forgive others. And just in case we didn't get the point here, Jesus adds at the end of the Lord's Prayer these words. For if you forgive men when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive man their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. That doesn't sound right. In fact, it sounds kind of harsh. Why would God make such a demanding statement as this? Well, there's a few reasons I can think of. First, we should do that for others because God did that for us. Remember how great this was to realize <clears throat> that we don't have to pray for all our sins, that God would forgive us as often as we ask. At one point in his ministry, Jesus was teaching his disciples about forgiveness. And Peter asked him, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother when he sins against me? Up to seven times? Now, Peter was being generous here. In Jewish religion, circle, religious circle, it was taught that you only had to forgive someone three times. After three times around, all bets were off. And you could shut a guy down. But that's not how Jesus saw it. Jesus told Peter, I tell you, not seven times, but 77 times. After the 15th time or so, I would begin to lose count. And of course, that's the point. In essence, Jesus was saying that his followers needed to get used to handing out free refills. Just like God does. If you will, we are subsidiaries or a branch office of God. We represent Him in this world. And since we serve God who forgives us, we need to be like Him in this world. We need to model his kind of forgiveness to an undeserving world. Because he forgave us when we didn't deserve forgiveness. So Jesus corrects Peter, thinking with a short statement. Then he illustrates his point with a parable. He said, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. As he began to the settlement, a man who owed him 10,000 talents was brought to him. Since he was not able to pay, the master ordered that he and his wife and children and all that he had to be sold to repay the debt. The servant fell on his knees before him. Be patient with me, he begged, and I will pay back everything. The servant's master took pity on him, canceled the debt, and let him go. Well, that was nice. <coughs> Wasn't that a nice for that king to forgive such a large debt? Of course it was. But then Jesus completes the parable. But when that servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii. He grabbed him and began to choke him. Pay back what you owe me, he demanded. His fellow servants fell on his knees and begged him, 
Be patient with me and I will pay you back. But he refused and instead he went off and had the man thrown into prison until he could pay the debt. When the older servants saw what had happened, they were greatly distressed and went and told their master everything that had happened. Here this man had been forgiven of an astronomical debt. But he can't forgive a man of his debt who owed just far so much less. Well, that didn't go down very well with the king. Then the master called the servant in. You wicked servant, he said. I canceled all that debt of yours because you begged me to. Shouldn't you have mercy on your fellow servants just as I had on you? In anger, his master turned him over to the jailer to be tortured until he should pay back all he owed. This is how my heavenly father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brothers from your heart. That's pretty harsh. But you can understand how God can be upset with us if we do not forgive. He forgave us all, all our sins. In fact, whenever we ask for forgiveness, even if it's seven times or 70 times a day, we still have that promise. But then... He watches some of the very people he's forgiven. Hold bitterness and anger inside because somebody sinned against them. No matter what another person has done to you or me, their sins against us pale in comparison of our sins against God. Yeah, I can understand why God would be upset. Toby Mac once said this, Don't let what has been done to you become bigger than what you did for you, what he did for you. Don't let what has been done to you become bigger than what he did for you. So first, I need to forgive others because God has forgiven me. I can't let what has been done to me to become bigger than what he has did for me. Secondly, I need to forgive others because if I don't, it messes with me. Did you notice the words Jesus said in his parable about unforgiven servants? In anger, his master turned him over to the jailers to be tortured until he should pay back all he owed. What Jesus was teaching was, if I don't forgive what others have done, to me, I suffer. I'll be tortured. My refusal to forgive will hurt me. There's been a number of scientific studies on unforgiveness and bitterness in people's lives. And these studies have shown some of the more obvious results that you would expect from these kind of attitudes. Folks that harbor unforgiveness tend to be extremely unhappy, filled with resentment, burdened with stress, and suffer from depression. But then there are the less obvious consequences to this mindset. Folks who can, can't forgive are more prone to have higher rates of divorce, and they tend to suffer from headaches, backaches, insomnia. One study said that unforgiveness leads to a buildup of a chemical called cortisol. Cortisol is not a good thing 
to have an abundance in your body. It wears down the brain, which leads to cell atrophy in memory loss. Dang, it must have just struck me right then. <laughs> it also raises blood pressure and blood sugar and hardens the arteries that lead to heart disease. Unforgiveness tortures those who harbor it. It hurts us. It hurts us in another way as well. I read about a teacher, I'm assuming at a Christian school, who once told each of her students to bring a clear plastic bag and a sack of potatoes to school. Then they were instructed to call to mind every person they had a grudge against. For every person they refused to forgive, they to choose a potato and write the name and date and put it in the plastic bag. The teacher told them they were to carry this bag everywhere they went putting it beside their bed at night, in the car seat when they drove, on their lap when they were riding, next to their desk during classes. Some bags became quite heavy, and lugging them around, well, kind of got hard. Paying attention to it at all times, and remembering not to leave it, in an embarrassing place was a hassle. And over time, what do you think happened to those potatoes? That's right, they began to stink. They became moldy, smelly, and began to sprout eyes. Do you catch what that teacher was trying to get across to her students? She was trying to teach them that unforgiveness is an inconvenience, embarrassing, and smelly irritation in their lives. Now, how do you know if you have not forgiven someone? You don't want to be in the same room with them. The mere mention of their name makes you cringe. If you hear about something that has hurt them or made their lives uncomfortable, how do you respond? You're not really sad. In fact, you're feeling pretty good. They finally gotten just a little of what they deserve. Good for them. In short, you tend to rejoice in their misfortune. And one of the chief marks that you've not forgiven them, forgiven someone, is that when you do talk about them, you tend to replay your story of how they hurt you. Why? Because you want those who listen to you to dislike that person as much as you do. And you tell those stories a lot. Yep, that's your sack of potatoes. You carry it to bed with you and it affects your marriage. You carry it to work and set it on your desk or machine that you work at. You carry it to family gatherings and plunk it right down in the middle of the dining room table. Yeah, it makes you a real joy to be around. I talked with one preacher some time back that mentioned a woman whose husband had cheated on her years ago. And she'd never forgiven him of it. She'll sit there every Sunday in church 
and you could see the bitterness in her. If you were around her, you could feel the hatred that ate away at her soul. So let's review. God hates it when we don't forgive others. He won't forgive us if we don't forgive others. It hurts us physically when we don't forgive others. It damages our relationship when we refuse to forgive someone. But it is our sack. We deserve to carry it with us. Because after all, that person didn't deserve to be forgiven. But neither did you. And neither did I. But God forgave us anyway. At the end of my sermons, people will often tell me, nice sermon or something to that effect. And I really do appreciate that. It makes me feel good to know my efforts are appreciated. But this morning, I much prefer you to tell me, Jeff, I have someone I need to forgive. And I'm going to make the effort to forgive them. That's what God calls us to do. But you can't really know how to forgive others until you've experienced the forgiving power of God's mercy in your own life. May you grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ.